Good afternoon and welcome to the Midday Brief on your Joy News channel on Multi TV. My name is Jennifer Jane Asante. This afternoon, we bring you interesting updates and informative stories starting with day four of the teachers' nationwide strike, despite a plea by President Mahama to cease fire and several inconclusive meetings to get them back in the classrooms. We also have President Mahama who plays down the disaffection of Ghanaians, saying that there shall be no coup. As Ghanaians continue to grapple with darkness, officials of the Asogli plant have told government to pay all outstanding debts before they can resume operations. And in wellness today, stay with us for the updates and the details of these stories. We'll be back after this short break. Now, teachers on government payroll are continuing with their strike over certain monetary benefits that are due them, which they say are not forthcoming. The strike, which started on Monday, coincides with ongoing end-of-term examinations, as well as external examinations conducted by the West African Examinations Council and has forced many of the schools to deploy national service persons and even fellow students as invigilators. Emmanuel Ante, however, reports some of the schools have managed to convince some of the teachers to break ranks with their striking colleagues. A visit to some senior high schools in Accra revealed the final practical exams and oral English for Wasi students are underway. Students who had no exams to write, however, did not find reason to stay in the classroom. The teachers are on strike, like big time, because it's our final year and they are not coming to class. It's really affecting us like badly. The head teachers, though also members of the teacher unions, have remained at post, seeing to the day-to-day -day running of their schools by all means possible. This includes the use of non-teaching staff such as cooks, cleaners and students to perform roles that have been abandoned by the striking teachers. Some teachers, though, were on hand to support in some of the schools, even though we were not allowed to film, for fear such rebels could be sanctioned by their unions. Our investigations, however, revealed the teachers had been enticed with special packages to break ranks. The headmistress of Nungwa Secondary School, Kate Bannerman, would not confirm or deny any such arrangement, except to say their school is coping with the situation. I have mobilized the non-teaching staff from the account session and the administration. And then the Form 4 students who are more or less idle, you know, we ask them to study hard during the evening so that in the morning they could help us. Some of the teachers want to help, but you know, they are not very sure of their reaction from colleagues. So they are in the background. And so that's how we are managing the situation. We are all hoping that by the time we start the WASI proper, the situation will normalize. At the Teshin Presby Senior High School, the arrangement for the teachers to be paid interim allowances to help with the invigilation of the WASI exams had been formalized. Students and non-teaching staff were, however, helping with supervision of internal exams. Meanwhile, in most of the basic schools visited, pupils affected by the strike could be seen on their own during instructional hours. These pupils said their teacher showed up in the morning but left shortly thereafter. She came in the morning and she has gone out. They have gone to meet him. So they will be back. The school heads are meanwhile hopeful the situation will be resolved as soon as possible as there could be crisis if the teachers are not at post when the written exams get underway next month. Now the National Labour Commission has given teachers seven days to resolve their grievances with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and to report to the Labour Commission. The directive came after a meeting organized at the behest of the NLC with the leaders of the Teachers' Union and the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission attending. Wednesday's meeting was to address the impasse, which has culminated into the teachers declaring a strike for the past three days. The NLC also directed the teachers to call off the strike as they begin the seven-day discussion with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Leaders of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, as well as the Ghana National Association of Teachers, did not give any indication that they were going to call off the strike. Now, we have on the line 
members of the interested parties and the teachers front strike has entered its fourth day. Several meetings to get the teachers back into the classrooms have yielded no results. Government had hoped to get the teachers back today as the Labour Commission ordered their dammit teachers back with no, f with no avail. While yesterday's meeting was inconclusive and why the teachers have resolved to stay out of the classrooms when it is an apparent defiance of the labor law, we will find out. We've been joined on the line by Kwamina Ahinakwa Kwashi, who is an officer with the Salaries, Terms and Conditions Office at NAT. Hello? Hello. Kwamina, uh, we have you on the line and we want to know why are you still out of the classroom despite yesterday's meeting? Yeah, I think uh, what we need to do uh, as leaders is to uh, consult our various uh, executive councils. Yesterday, uh, after the Labour Commission meeting, we had a meeting of NAGRA. So what we, we decided was that uh, on Monday, which is 25th March, we will meet our executive council, and then whatever decision that they take, we will communicate to the entire Ghanaian public. Hello? It's Yosin, who is the director of the Grievances Negotiation and Collective Bargaining at the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Kwame Ina, if you could stay on the line for me, we can get a response from him concerning the impasse that you have reached. Hello, okay. Cornelius. Yes, I can. Oh. Cornelius, the teachers say they are not going back to the classroom. What are you going to do about it? Hello? Hello, Cornelius. All right, it seems Cornelius is not there, but Kwamna, if you're not going back to the classroom, isn't that a clear violation of the labor laws? No, we have we have not we have not violated the labor laws because the the ruling was in two parts, right? And labor commission has Ghana Education Service and Fair Wages to put their heads together and then meet us. But I have in my hand here a letter which has been written by a Fair Wages and Service Commission dated 20th March 2013, with reference to my FWSC stroke B stroke SCR uh, dot five volume two stroke seven four and we are asking Ghana Education Service Management to negotiate with us on the non salary related issues. But if you will recall, collective agreement is a complete document. After which one you negotiate and then you finish you must sign. So if they are now asking us to negotiate the non salary related issue, how are you going to sign the document? Hmm. It is not possible for us to negotiate only the non salary related issue. We want to negotiate on, on the entire, entire document after which we will sign. Then it becomes binding on both parties. All right. And is the and commission the unwilling to do this? Sorry? Is the commission unwilling to do this? Yeah, that is from, from the tone of the letter. It, it, that is exactly what they are trying to say. Because collective agreement has both salary related and non salary related issues. So if you ask GES to negotiate only the non salary related issue, what are you talking about? You understand? We need to sit down and negotiate the entire document after which we will sign. Because that is what the Labour Act says. When you finish with the collective agreement, you have to sign. Both parties will have to sign the document. All I right, don't know what you this is running away from this simple too. Because the law establishing services and science commission act mandates them to coordinate manage and monitor our collective bargaining process in which government is a direct or indirect employer. I don't know why they are sucking up, taking away that responsibility. They must come and sit with us at the table and negotiate the collective agreement. And until such a time, you intend to remain out of the classrooms? I want to believe to say that any time they invite us to come and sit down at the table and negotiate the collective agreement, both salary related and non-salary related, we will ask our teachers to, to go back to the classroom. So until that time, you're remaining out of the classroom? You have said so. All right. Thank you very much, Kwamina Ahinakwa Kwashi.
He's an officer with the Salaries, Terms and Conditions Office at NAT, telling us that until the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission is ready to sit with them, they will not go back to the classroom. I understand we have Cornelius Yosin on the line. He's the Director of Grievance Negotiations and Collective Bargaining at the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Good afternoon, Cornelius. Good afternoon. Cornelius, the teachers say they are not going to come back into the classroom until you have signed the collective bargaining agreement with them. You see, I think that uh, my, my, my friend, Mr. Kashi, is a bit uninformed about the whole matter. Category 2 and 3 allowances, which are subsumed in the single spine salary policy, is the financial element of the conditions of service. And Mr. Kashi is aware that the financial elements of the conditions of service are not to be negotiated at the institutional level. So therefore, whether we like it or not, the category 3 and 3 allowances have to be negotiated at the public services joint standing negotiation committee level and at the service classification level. The compared to more the consolidation of the allowances decided at the public services committee level and the service classification and the institutional level will now comprise the new conditions of service. You see, the law is very clear about which items can be negotiated at the fair wages, level of the fair wages and salaries commission. And I'm saying also that I heard some other officials from the NAT saying that they are going to meet with the, their members and agree on whether or not they are going back to work. But I want to say that if you, when the court gives you an order, it's not a question of going to meet or not going to meet. They have to change their regulations to show that when it is a court order or a national labor commission order, then their rules are superseded by the order. And so you don't say that the court has given you an order and I'm going to meet my members and decide whether or not I'm going back to work or not. That was seriously improper. All right. So in your opinion, they should be in the classrooms even whilst the negotiations are going on. But here is a case yeah. where they say they are not going until that agreement is reached and signed. Are there That's punitive measures ahead of them? That's why I'm saying that those that can be negotiated with them directly, we have written a letter to the Ghana Education Service. So we meet together and we look at that. This is what the Labour Commission said yesterday when we went to the National Labour Commission. But the category 2 and 3 allowances definitely cannot be negotiated with the GES alone. It is, you see, the whole idea is to harmonize and standardize all the allowances in the public service. So if you meet you, GES alone or teachers alone, and negotiate something for you, what happens to the public, larger public service? It means more or less you are throwing the policies out of here because you have different, uh, uh, different allowances, sorry, different rates of allowances for the different services, and therefore the end of the policy. All right, but can't you meet with them, come to an agreement concerning their particular issue now, and sign that agreement so that they can go back to the classrooms? <laughs> that is the idea. We are telling them that you know something, those that you can negotiate at your level, we can negotiate it and have a memorandum of understanding that this is take immediate effect. And then when the category 2 and 3 allowances have been negotiated, then they will be added on, you see. And we also say that uh, already you have some allowances such as the vehicle maintenance allowance. That is existing. The policy is that pending the negotiation of the category 2 and 3 allowances, these ones are to be negotiated, uh, sorry, are paid at the existing rate. You see, and I'm aware, as I'm speaking, I'm aware that the Canada Education Service has almost finished its job to find out which people are involved and therefore pay them. So I believe that the best way is for them to come to the table, we discuss, we agree, and then all these together will form the new conditions of service. All right. Now, are there punitive measures? I asked this before, but I didn't get a clear answer on that. Are there punitive measures for the teachers if they do not go back to the classroom immediately? Yes, yeah, today somebody made a very good analogy that you, a teacher, when a pupil does wrong, you punish him. What about if the teacher does wrong? I believe that, that question is an answer for the a question for the National Labor Commission to answer. I'm aware that they have powers to go to court to enforce them to the leadership for contempt. And if they don't do it, they can be incarcerated. You see, they have to be a bit careful here because when the National Labor Commission has given you an order, you don't say you will not do. All right. It appears we have lost Cornelia. I'm on the line. Oh, okay. It's Kwamina Hina Kwakwashi that we have lost. I still have Cornelius Yosin on the line. Yes. You are not sure. Uh, 
you just said that it is up to the Labour Commission. That's the, that's to the Labour Commission to take action yes. when the uh, others are, are not uh, obeyed or, you know, adhered to. All right. Your position is that you are ready to reach a memorandum of understanding with the teachers as things stand now, and when the rest of the benefits come in, it would be given due to them. The teachers say they don't believe that you will follow through. Could it oh, be right, that you have right. made this promise several times before and it hasn't come to fruition? No, no, but when have you ever heard that having a problem with teachers until now? It's not true. It's not true at all. The teachers and go on strike case. almost every year. No, 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 that's a different issue. You see, the National Labor Commission is there to ensure that the various parties do their part of the bargain. We had the agreement yesterday. The National Labor Commission is there. If we don't do our part, they will be there to sanction us. The same way that if they do their, don't do their part, the National Labor Commission has to sanction them. All right. Thank you very much, Cornelius Yorson. Thank you, too. All right. Moving on to other news, but still with education. The teachers, I'm sorry, moving on to um, education, Tewu President Peter Lumo called on President John Mahama not to plead with teachers to go back to the classroom, but to direct the Ghana Education Service, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, and all involved bodies to quickly heed to the union's call for better conditions of service. This is not the first time the president is making an appeal when these issues come up. Mm. I believe that it is not a question of appealing. Direct the bodies that must solve the problem. Direct them to solve the problem. Mm. Because the question of appeal, we have heard it several times. Those who must solve the problem mm -hmm. so should sit up and solve this problem once and for all. He was concerned with government's continuous neglect of Tewu members. The whole problem has a history. Mm -hmm. Last week, Wednesday, there was a meeting at the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission between Fair Wages, our employer, that is the Ghana Education Service, mm -hmm. the Controller and Accountant General, Nat Nagrat, and Tewu. Okay. Last week, Wednesday. Mm -hmm. The problems that have led to all this were discussed there. Okay. Tewu stated is problems that we also have. Friday, organized labor and government met at the Independence Square. That meeting was chaired by the Vice President, uh, His Excellency Chrissy Misata. Chrissy Misata. Mm. At that meeting, Tewu was present. I, yes, I was present. Okay. I stated Tewu's case, issues that we have with, how do you call it, uh, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Mm. I went ahead to say that, look, we have, at that meeting, that we heard that Nat and Nagat had declared a strike. Mm -hmm. We stated our case that, look, we also have issues. So we should be taking serious before it leads to something else. That was Friday. Mm. Then Saturday, there was the news that government was meeting Nat Nagrat mm -hmm. at the Flaster Farms. Tewu was not invited to that meeting. Peter Lomo said that they would only heed the NLC's call if Tewu's grievances were met. This, we have a, issues that have been tabled before the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. Mm -hmm. We are written since 4th of February. As we speak, today is 21st of, uh, of March, of March 2013. No, no acknowledgement. Response. We have not been invited to any meeting. Those who must solve their problem mm. must solve it. And this will end. Now, as proof of how serious the teacher's strike is, President John Dramani Mahama has added his voice in a plea to the teachers to go back to the classroom. And um, I'll use this forum to, now that I'm talking about teachers, to appeal to our teachers you know, to call up the strike and go back to the classrooms. <clears throat> I know that various groups of organized labor have 
different different you know uh, complaints that they have but i think that the complaints are better dealt with in an environment of dialogue <clears throat> rather than an environment of in intimidation and often when that happens it is the children who suffer. The timing is absolutely wrong. The children have started their exams, and we need the teachers there to guide them, not only to guide them, but also to invigilate the exams to ensure that the integrity of the examination process is not compromised. And I think that they should have a thought for that and uh, put the nation's interests you know, above their own uh, professional interests or personal interests and go back uh, to the classrooms while we get the Fair Wages Commission to deal with any grievances that they might have. That was President Mahama saying the timing of the teacher's strike is wrong and is causing the children to suffer. It is now time for us to take a short break. We'll be back with more news. Welcome back. Now, let's take you up to the north. People who patronize the services of the Wa Slaughterhouse say, though they are aware of the unhygienic conditions there, they simply can't be bothered. One is hit by a very offensive odor and pretty horrible scenes, which give indications either very little cleaning has been done or none at all. The Upper West correspondent, Rafiq Salam, reports on what he describes as an eyesore of a slaughterhouse. Simply put, there is nowhere in the slaughterhouse which can be described as clean. There are clear indications that from the slaughterhouse to the final sales point at the war market, the meat produced here, without doubt, is not prepared under any hygienic condition. On arrival at the slaughterhouse, the first thing that greets you is the bad odor coming from an open safety tank filled to the brim with blood dumped there for several months from the cows. The floor on which these cows are slaughtered and skinned is not tidy as one can spot remnants of feces of the cows stuck to the floor, evidence that the place has seen no cleaning for days. The young men who skin the animals are not well dressed, adding up to the unhygienic conditions that reign here at the slaughterhouse. After the butchers finish skinning the cow, they pick out the intestines outside the slaughterhouse for washing. This they do without clean water. Moving away from the slaughterhouse to the final sales point at the war market, the meat is sold in the open, giving room for flies and other insects to have fresh meat to rest on. An official of the WA Municipal Environmental Health Office attached to the slaughterhouse, Smith Narkofi, concedes their working environment is appalling, but was quick to add that those working there must improve it. We've been thinking that uh, maybe we should have been some improvements in the, in the room, like uh, maybe we try to paint it. And, uh, we part of some of the that's that are on the floor. Rafiq Salam. Scary sights there. Now, President John Mahama says there is enough reason to believe that Ghana has gone past the era of military takeovers, reacting to a publication suggesting there's that there still remains the possibility the president said Ghanaians have come to appreciate the value of democracy. He was interacting with some former parliamentarians who called on him at the Flagstaff House. The former members of parliament were at the Flagstaff House to initiate the president into the former parliamentarians forum. They pledged support to government saying part of their activities is sensitization against any other form of governance besides the democratic path the country has chosen. You have membership from all the political parties in Ghana and we don't talk partisan politics. We are resolved that we the people of Ghana we are not going back ever to the dark days of military rule. And we are doing everything possible to create awareness about the virtues of parliamentary democracy. We are also a group which want to cater for the welfare of former members of parliament. 
and that is natural enough. President Mahama said he remains confident the country will not yield to military adventurists. I don't believe that we can have any return to the dark old days. I was <clears throat> reading the papers today and somebody was talking about a vision of coup d'etat. I reject it. It shall never happen. <laughs> and uh, by God's grace, it will never uh, happen again. We believe that our people would reap the dividends of democracy. They're beginning to see it already in terms of the advancement we've made since 1992. Every government comes into office and contributes its quota to moving this country forward. Well, debates on the floor of the House have been fantastic, you know, and it has advanced the democratic culture of this country. If today Ghana is being called the model of democracy in Africa, it is uh, to a large extent because of the strength of the parliament that we have. He asked the group to be free to offer advice to government. Also at the presidency were student and other youth groups, including the National Union of Ghana Students, Ghana National Union of Polytechnics, and the Law Students Union. They asked that government conduct comprehensive research into youth and graduate unemployment. We are of the view that the youth unemployment situation requires a much more comprehensive strategy. While these programs are implemented in the short term, we wish to suggest that His Excellency commissions a comprehensive empirical study into the youth unemployment situation, which will better inform policy and strategy in this regard to help address the problem. Our brothers and sisters in senior high school are worried about the ongoing industrial action by teachers. While we appeal, we appeal to teachers to exercise restraint, taking into account the effect of their strike action on students, we also call on government to manage the situation so that it will not affect students. In his response, President Mahama said governments would revamp all the youth leadership skills training institutes in the country to undertake the youth entrepreneurship program. He added, the statistical service has been directed to research and provide data on the rate of unemployment so that government interventions would make the expected impact. While we're making progress as a nation, we're not making it as fast as we should to convert that progress into opportunities for our people. And so we need to th think together and think through and see how we can make that growth convert into jobs and opportunities for our, our, our young people. One of the things we've been doing is to um, create the legislative environment that allows this to happen. And that's why as soon as we came into office, we started working on the youth policy. He called for constructive criticisms and advice from the youth that could help government accelerate national development. Kifti and Doapia, Joy News, Flagstaff House. Now armed men suspected to be robbers have attacked traders at the Kejetia market and robbed them of their wares 24 hours after a similar attack on residents living around the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi. The armed men launched their attack using motorbikes and wielding AK-47 and pump-action guns, fired several shots and laid siege on residents. The men, numbering about nine, attacked the residents at 7 p.m. when there was a power outage. They left many vehicles damaged as motorists crashed into each other in an attempt to escape. We have on the line my colleague Ohiming Teria, who is in Kumasi, and will give us an update on the incident. Good afternoon, Ohiming. Good afternoon. How are things in Kumasi now? Yes, uh, I would say Kumasi is calm at this time of the day when residents are going about their uh, normal business. But so residents uh, have uh, this fear uh, that they, Kumasi is not safe for them. So when, when you talk to the police, police will say we are doing our best to ensure the security of all residents in the Kumasi metropolis. So that is the situation as we speak now. All right. Now, lately, we've been hearing a lot of unfortunate incidences happening in Kumase. Is there anything that is linking these incidents to each other? Yes. Uh, from what happened last uh, Tuesday night at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology area, uh, between that particular stretch of road and Anuraga Junction, uh, one would say that this is just a repetition of what happened that day. 
So uh, it's almost the same. Because, for instance, when you look at the modus operandi of this particular arm group, they use unregistered motorbikes and also, at the point, they are half naked and they always operate uh, when there's power outages. For instance, again, last night, between uh, airport roundabout, uh, Ark Town, and then Bansma, and there are also reported cases at uh, Kigetia, uh, these uh, happenings occurred when there was fire, uh, the power outage. And beyond this, the, the star or their modus of branding is almost the same. So I believe that is the same group who goes around the metropolis uh, uh, terrorizing residents here. All right. Now, were there any fatalities or wounded as a result of the attack? Yes. Uh, from the first uh, incident, I, I saw a few residents uh, who were wounded in their uh, attempt to uh, run away from the armed men. Some had to uh, be helped out of gases because they, they, they fell into the gases and they were helped, uh, helped out. For instance, I saw a nursing mother uh, who residents helped uh, to, to, to go, get away from the armed men. So I would say for now, though we, we are not reporting any gunshot wounds, but uh, people who rush to run away from the armed men uh, end up either uh, falling on the ground or uh, hitting uh, themselves uh, against objects uh, object on their way uh, to escape from them. So that is uh, what is happening uh, as we speak now. But uh, I would say residents now are devising ways uh, to also uh, protect themselves uh, against these robbers. They say instead of staying out for a long time, this time around when they come to work, for instance, they'll go home as early as possible uh, to avoid uh, being uh, trapped uh, in this particular incident. So that is what is happening. All right. Thank you very much, Ohimeng Teria, for that update. Let's move to the presidency, where my colleague Seth Kwame Boating is with the president, who is highly concerned about the unstable security situation in Kumase. As you heard, reports have indicated that in less than 48 hours, armed robbers have struck the township twice, laying siege on helpless victims. Today, the president has met with the security chiefs, and as I said, my colleague Seth Kwame Boating is our man there at the Flagstaff House. Seth, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Jennifer. What can you tell us about this meeting? Okay, so the um, security chiefs met with the president, the IGP, the CDS, National Security, and they briefed the president about developments in Kumasi. The president expressed concern about what is happening in Kumasi. And in a media briefing a while ago by the information minister, uh, Mahama Yareka, he said the president was satisfied with steps the, the security agencies have taken in Kumasi to deal with the matter. And he has told them that he's ready to support them with anything that they will need to uh, flush uh, the, these um, uh, criminals out, uh, and push them somewhere. And he is also urging them to keep on um, doing what they are doing in Kumase, uh, so the security of residents there are very well ensured. Jennifer. All right. Is there any concrete plan? I mean, you have mentioned that the president is taking steps. But what specific things have been outlined? Can you tell us? We told he was briefed, and he told they told him that they had taken steps already. So they mentioned the steps they are taking in Kumase to the president, and he told them that he was satisfied with the, those steps. But he's encouraging them to go uh, the extra mile to do more to ensure the safety of residents in Kumase. Okay. Um, when we spoke with Ohiming Teria, he told us that these incidents occurred during a blackout, an electricity power outage. Did the president make any remark concerning the energy crisis in relation to these incidents? That wasn't mentioned during the press briefing by the information minister. You know, the media, we had a chance to cover the, only the opening. They didn't talk. We were asked to go out. Uh, so after the meeting, the information minister will come out and brief us. If that uh, discussion happened in, in that close door meeting, I, I can't confirm, but the information minister uh, didn't tell us that. All right. Thank you very much, Seth Kwame Boiting, for that update. We know you'll be bringing us more news if there is any, as and when. Now, earlier, the police in Kumasi rounded up 150 suspected armed robbers and criminals in a swoop as part of measures to rid the metropolis of criminals. The exercise was carried out at Akurem Asafo. 
Educrome abandoned affordable housing projects noted for criminal activities. The police have pledged to make life uncomfortable for criminals in the region. Mohamed Nuruddin brings you this report. The Ashanti Regional Police Command has vowed to continuously combat crime and provide security to innocent people in the region. It says nothing will prevent them from bringing criminal activities down. In a press briefing today, the police disclosed its outfit has arrested 54 armed robbers in the first quarter of the year, and most of them have been tried, while others were put on bail. In their swoop on Monday, police arrested 150 suspected criminals who are currently awaiting trial. DCOP Augustine Janine also hinted of last night's sporadic shooting at Aija Tech Junction. At the moment, we have sent our men after those who operated last night. Last night, at around 7 p.m., we had information that a group of armed robbers were operating at Aija. So quickly, we dispatched the patrol teams to the place. And uh, from information available to us, their number was around 30. So when we were chasing them, they took different directions. The police also wishes the evacuation of all persons occupying the abandoned affordable housing project. Items found on them during a search were 39 passports, 16 rubber stamps, three local manufactured pistols, three live ammunitions, 97 assorted mobile phones, one Dell laptop, six machetes, 3,816 Ghana cities, among others. The police command is appealing to the general public to provide accurate information to police to arrest criminals. Welcome back. Now, yesterday was Oral Hygiene Day, and we had previously talked about bad breath, which is a symptom of today's wellness topic, tonsillitis. Tonsillitis is a, an inflammation of the glands of the throat, which results in a sore throat. Tonsillitis can be caused by either viruses or bacteria. Most cases of tonsillitis resolve in a few days without antibiotic medication. Very severe cases require surgical attention. But there are a few things you can do to keep it from getting there. Watch today's wellness. The ice cream was almost enough to make tonsillitis worth it. Now moving on to international news. South Korean officials say a cyber attack on South Korean banks and broadcasters came from an internet address in China, but the identity of those behind it cannot be confirmed. And U.S. President Barack Obama has arrived in the West Bank city of Ramallah for talks with Palestinian Authority President Ma Mahmoud Abbas. 